All right, I am so excited to be here. Um, thank you so much, Todd, and all of the organizers of All Things Open for having me. This is such a wonderful conference. I mean, I'm really passionate about open source, so I'm so glad to be here. Um, so why are they having me here today? Uh, well, it might be because they're curious about how Vue 3 actually works. And thankfully, that's a question I can answer because otherwise that would be kind of awkward. Um, today, we're going to go through an animated guide of Vue 3 reactivities and internals. Um, we're gonna go through some really you know, um, deep down stuff, but I'm gonna introduce it at a kind of high level with some animation so that you can understand what's changing and what's staying the same. As mentioned, I'm Sarah Drasner or Sarah Edo on Twitter. I'm on the Vue core team. Um, I'm a VP of developer experience at Netlify. As Todd mentioned, I also um, am a co-organizer of Concatenate along with amazing people like CodeBeast on Twitter, Gift, um, a few other people that you might uh, be aware of. Um, I'm, I mentioned that I'm a VP of, uh, of developer experience at Netlify, which is neither Netflix or Shopify, which is very confusing for my parents. But if you're not familiar with Netlify, it's my favorite way to, uh, to deploy sites and apps, which is why I asked to work there. We also support a lot of open source projects like React and Kubernetes and uh, Vue and Lodash. So if you're interested in open source support, that is also a good place to do so. So I'm gonna walk through everything today, but I want to I want you to know that all the demos for the talk are also open source. They're all written in JavaScript, even though they're animated. I'm gonna be showing you some animated things on the screen, but they're all still just JavaScript. Um, it's using a lot of the same premises that we'll be covering, which makes it very meta. I'm gonna explain some disparate concepts, sort of in an FAQ format, based on real questions that people ask me. But one thing to note is that the concepts that I'm gonna show you are all interrelated. So they work in concert together to create a single experience. So what is reactivity? The canonical example that people usually show because it's a great one is an Excel spreadsheet. So if we were to you know, have a cell that was two and three and the last one is five, if we're updating that and we have that sum, it's automatically going to update in that final cell, right? We have we initially had a sum of five, but we didn't have to change anything in order to make that six. We just changed the first value and then that you know updated as well. This is not the way that things work in JavaScript. So if I had a value of two and I had a sum and it was five, if my value of two I reassign to three and then log sum again it will stay five. So how do we adjust to changes in JavaScript in terms of reactivity? And reactivity is something that is a, you know, a kind of programming concept that is bigger than just Vue, uh, but it's really useful for UIs and applications because we do a lot of adjusting to change. So in order to make those changes in JavaScript, uh, we would have to detect if there's a change in one of those values, we'd have to track the function that changes it, we'd have to trigger a function so that it can update that final value. So how does Vue 3 do this? Vue 3 just came out. So how does that do this? Uh, we get this done with a thing called proxies. So I made an animated explainer that goes over it. We start with an object. We add a handler and a proxy to the object. In this case, it's the same. But look, we can intercept the object with this proxy. And here's the cool part. If we change the first object, the proxied object updates accordingly without adjusting the handler. With reactivity, we can respond to changes instantly. Cool, that was quick and kind of high level. So let's explore this concept in a little bit more depth and then move on. So let's dive into what proxies are in general. A proxy is an object that encases another object or function and allows you to intercept it. So he, at its base, here's what it looks like. New proxy, and you pass in the target and the handler. And let's look at what that looks like. So if I have my dinner and the meal is tacos, I can create a handler that basically has this get method that passes in the target and the prop, and we're returning the target prop in square bracket notation. If we get the meal and we say 
const proxy is the dinner and the handler. And then we console log proxy.meal. What do you think is going to happen? Well, you see tacos is returned. That's awesome because tacos are amazing. Uh, but what if we want to intercept this value? And we can actually do that quite easily. So we can console log something like intercepted here or anything that you'd wish. And we still return that, you know, our return prop our return prop and target prop and square bracket notation. And cool, if what, what do we see? We see intercepted and then tacos. So that gives us kind of like a useful um, way to kind of be involved in that object as we proxy that object. So you can see console.log intercepted and there we've logged intercepted. So what if we want to do something totally different? We don't, we don't necessarily want to do exactly the same thing. We don't have to return the target and prop. We can actually do something completely different. So we can console log, we swapped out your dinner and I can return burger. And then if I say, you know, proxy.meal and we say we swapped out your burger, your, your meal and that's a burger. And now we're getting a burger. I mean, that's, that's crazy. I don't want a burger, I want a taco. So in JavaScript, that's called the trap. Um, it's because we can do and we can do many things and we can intercept things in many ways um and yeah it's a trap uh we don't necessarily want a burger instead of a taco uh so the key here is that we can intercept this in any way that we want but if you want to use it in the same way you have to remember to also return that value okay so let's go back to the initial uh, example here. So we're returning with that square bracket notation, but there's another way to extract the value. This is something that only proxies allow us to do. You can say reflects.get and spread the arguments. And one, and one of those arguments that you can add is called receiver. What's important about receiver is that it allows us to bind this properly. That's important because in Vue, we do a lot of binding of this. We have to bind this appropriately in order for Vue to work under the hood. So this is really nice because we have proper binding. So now let's talk about what we might need here in order to make Vue reactive. We mentioned that we might need to track some of those values. So we need a function that will track any changes that occur with these objects, with these properties and values, which is called pre called track in uh, view three, and it saves any changes. Those changes that it saves are then called effects. So now in our set method, we are going to show all of the same things, the target key, but we are also passing in the value and we're returning that reflect of the set of all of those arguments. But there's one last thing that we can do. Oh, and this is called trigger in Vue. So we're triggering, we're running the changes that have to be updated. And there's one thing that we want to do for efficiency. We want to store the old value and the new value because we want to check if the old value is different from the new value and then run trigger because we don't necessarily want to run trigger every single time. We only want to run it when something has changed. Cool. So now remember this list. This list is the list of things that we'd have to do to update those values automatically or with some reactive premises. Um, so, okay, looking at this, de detect when there's a change in one of the values, we no longer have to do this anymore because proxies is already doing this for us. We're gonna track the function that changes it. And this is literally called track in view. We're going to trigger the function so that it can update that final value. And finally, the function that changes it is called effect. So if you need to find any of these methods, the code base is here. Now, you know, in view two, everything was one single package. In view three, we split it out into many, many packages. Uh, uh, reactivity is now a package in and of itself. So you can use that separately from all of the rest of you. And you might ask like, why is that necessary? Well, let's say you were working with non-DOM operations, right? There's a lot of stuff that Vue does in order to work with the virtual DOM that you don't necessarily need if you're working with Electron or native development. So that's a separate package so that you can code split and tree shake. Um, and all of the packages are separate now. So you can have an extremely small build. Um, if you'd like to check out any of the things that I mentioned before, you can see them in this package in particular. And if you wanted to look at them for just 
your life for any other curiosity reasons, that's where they are. Another thing is that proxies are now ES6. Previously, it was ES5 and below. So object.define property was how we used uh, view three. So view th or view two, in view three, we're using proxies. Um, we are making a separate package that's a little bit bigger to support older browsers, but this smaller build supports modern browsers and is um, really, really uh, performant and efficient. So you can check out all of that work in the view next repo. Cool. So let's dig into how watchers work. If you're familiar with Vue, you might know something about watchers. Watchers are a way to hook into some of that reactivity and adjust to changes. So how do proxies relate to these final DOM updates? How do we hook into them with watchers? So if you're not familiar with watchers, here's how they work. Anytime we change this property, you can see that we're watching the same data property as that counter. So we've got the counter is zero, and then we're watching the counter and we're logging the new value and the old value. And if we increase it or decrease it, you can see I'm watching that property. Anytime the property changes, I can console log and I, all, I can also do a ton of other things, uh, but it gives me access to the new and old versions of the value anytime something changes. So how does this work in Vue 3? Before we dive into that concept, there are a set of base concepts to understand. Get it set? Anyway, um, <laughs> in order to understand the inner workings, we'll have to cover sets, maps, and weak maps. A set is a series of only values similar to an array where a particular value can only be inserted once. So what does that mean? If you have something like my lunch items and you have this new set of taco, burger, taco, and you console log my lunch items, the set is really only going to store the taco and the burger. It's going to throw out anything that's redundant. So it's going to throw out my other taco, which is really sad. I can only get that once. A map is sort of like an object. Um, it's got some main differences, but you can think of it similarly because a map is a series of keys and values. Uh, but it has some key differences and it has actually a lot of differences, but we're going to cover the ones that are really pertinent for view three. Key value pairs remember their explicit ordering. It performs better in scenarios involving frequent additions and removals. Like set, you can only add key value pairs once. And it has some nice methods like size, has, set, clear, delete by the key. Um, this isn't all the things that are different, uh, different about maps than objects, but we're covering the most crucial ones for our purposes. So just like in set, map uh, in a new map, in this example for new map, we can't keep the same key value pair twice, right? We saw that in set, where if I have new map dot set, lunch one is tacos, lunch two is burgers, but if I try to log another lunch one, it will throw it away. I get lunch one is tacos, lunch two is burgers, and that's it. It doesn't add it again. So the last thing that we're going to talk about is weak, weak map. So it's similar to a map, but the references are held weakly. In other words, if you delete something, the reference can be garbage collected, but in the map, it can't. So this also means that it loses the implicit ordering. It also loses some of those nice methods like has, delete, by the key, you know, size, and, and et cetera. But the main difference about weak map that's really crucial to view three is garbage, <laughs> literally garbage, but more like a happy kind of garbage because we like collecting garbage. This makes view much faster and I'll show you why. So if we have something like this object here, when you pass an object to a view instance as data, view converts it to a proxy. This proxy enables view to perform dependency tra tracking and change notification when pro pro uh, properties are accessed. There are two levels of dependencies for every component. The first level uses map and stores the dependency for every pro property. The second level uses set to track the effects that will be run when the values change. After the first render, we've tracked the list of dependencies in the property access during the render. Conversely, the component becomes a subscriber to each of these properties. When a proxy intercepts a set operation, the property will notify all of the subscribers and the components re-render. 
view reactivity eff efficiently tracks all of the changes in that application. Cool. So that was pretty high level. If you'd like more information, View Mastery does a wonderful job of this. Uh, they have a whole course on View 3 reactivity that I uh, suggest you try out. Okay, on to the next. We talked about reactivity and watchers, but how do those properties actually change in the DOM? How are these properties getting reflected? Get it? A little proxy joke in there in our interfaces. <laughs> okay, so now let's cover how does the virtual DOM actually work? You might have heard this phrase before, the virtual DOM or the view DOM. It's a concept that many JavaScript frameworks use to create really performant API uh, UI. So let's dig in. So here's the DOM. We make a copy in JavaScript called the virtual DOM. We do this because touching the DOM with JavaScript is computationally expensive. While performing updates in JavaScript is cheap, finding the required DOM nodes and updating them with JavaScript is expensive. So we batch calls and change the DOM all at once. The virtual DOM is a lightweight JavaScript object created by this render function. It takes three arguments, the element, the object with data, props, attributes, and an array. And the array is where we pass in children, which all have these arguments to. Here's the text in the div, and it's child the UL, the UL, and now in turn the LIs. If we need to update the list items, we do so in JavaScript. And only then do we update the actual DOM. The virtual DOM allows us to make performant updates to our UIs. Cool. But what are the differences between the virtual DOM and something like a server-side rendered application with say Nuxt or Gridsum? Um, let's cover that next. So what uh, one of the questions that I get frequently is what is hydration? And when we're working with some of these meta frameworks, it is done in a slightly different way. So, but, but before we talk about hydration, I wanna co first cover why it's necessary. So why something like Jamstack? With a client-side rendering solution, the server delivers a file without content until you fetch everything and the browser compiles it. And you're far away from that server, the latency for the request gets bigger. With older server-side rendering solutions, the server compiles and fetches everything, builds the web page, and delivers a fully populated HTML page. That's much faster. However, every time you navigate to a new route, the server has to do it all over again. It has to compile and fetch it and deliver it. This process delays the load sometimes by whole seconds. Recently, an approach called Jamstack has become popular, which addresses both issues. We build the whole site and deploy the content to CDNs, which means it's geo-replicated around the globe. We never go back to a server on additional requests. We call it Jamstack and not static because it extends beyond static. We can make the page dynamic with API calls or serverless functions, and the user can use it right away. What's more, because there's no server involved, there are fewer attack vectors. That makes Jamstack really performant and secure. So when we're using Jamstack premises and also things like Nuxt and Gridsum that are pre-rendered, not only are we having a single point of, uh, not only are we not having a single point of origin server, we don't have to make subsequent requests. It, and it has better security because we don't have access to that single point of origin in the server. So that in turn gives us amazing performance and better security. So. If it's statically rendered, here's the part where I get that question about that hydration, right? If it's statically rendered and everything is just rendered on the page, how do you actually interact with it? And that's where hydration comes in. It can speed up performance to initially serve raw HTML and CSS. We can do this by server-side rendering an app and delivering it statically. After it's been served, Vue needs to take over some of the elements that are dynamic. This is called hydration. So since the market ha markup has been rendered, we don't throw it away and recreate, recreate it. Instead, we wanna hydrate the DOM, just the pieces that are interactive and make those interactive. Here, the button can now respond to changes and we can add to the cart. And hydration allows us to create fast and secure sites and still have a reactive UI. Cool. So with this, these approaches, we can pre-build and pre-render our applications while still serving dynamic content. 
we learned a lot in what 20 minutes we covered how reactivity works how view three uses proxies how watchers work in view three how the virtual dom works in view three and how and why nuxt and gridsum are you using pre-rendered content and how they then hydrate the dom that's fantastic we now know so much and our boundaries are endless so if you ever need to access these materials to review all of the materials are open source on my github at this url and all of the slides and the code pens so that you can explore all of the code and all of the animations, but they are also in the view docs. I mentioned I'm on the view core team. So all of this explanation also lists, lives in the new reactivity system uh, or in the re reactivity section of our brand new documentation for the view three docs. So now can you not only build performant and beautiful experiences on the web, you understand how all of these reactive premises and concepts are helping keep your users focus on task and enabling them to have superpowers while they're enable while while they're traversing your application. Thank you.